Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you establish us in your word. Thank you, Father, that you continue to teach us, guide us, that we can grow in you. Today, Father, I ask that you teach your people, teach each one of us, and give us a glimpse of heaven. We pray, Father, that even we who are the heavenly people living on earth, that we understand more the concepts of what it means to be in heaven, to live in heaven, to work on earth. So thank you for all your grace and your mercy. Establish all your principles in our life. Open our eyes that we may see and know you, Father. We give you grace and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, Father, we bless you. Receive all the honor and the glory. And we continue to proclaim our love for you. We are covenanted to you, Father. We belong to you. We belong to Jesus by the blood of the Lamb. And we offer you our first love. We will not compromise on our love for you. We give you our first love, Father, our whole heart, mind, soul, and body. And unto Jesus be all glory, worship, and honor. Thank you, Father, for the presence of Jesus. Minister to our lives, Father. Let your will and the aspects of your will be guided upon your people to draw into that which you have for them. Let your word go forth mightily, like a two-edged sword, piercing into the dividing the sun of soul and spirit, so that everyone will enter into the rest which you have for us. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. Amen. Now again, just look at the chart, on uh, the heavenly man chart. Okay. So, we talk about this new chart where we are, and uh, we have a glimpse of the new glory in heaven here. So, we are growing from the spiritual man to the heavenly man. And uh, so, the glorious church will be like this. This one not glorious church yet. This one just victorious church. <laughs> so, victorious, uh, you can conquer the enemy. Glorious church is without spot, without wrinkle. I've come to understand more and more that in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, when uh, chapter 5, when the Lord says that the Lord Jesus is preparing a bride without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, it applies to spirit, soul, and body. All three areas. That's why the church is really transformed to be very much like Christ Jesus, and we have the glory of God upon our lives. And that is our inheritance and our privilege to enjoy in these times of the powers of the age to come. Mm. Praise God. Now, uh, that will do for the chat. Today, not much chat, but today I have lots of questions for you all. We start with the simple ones. Remember, you can ask questions in, in between. We start with the simple one. And um, why do you think Jesus have a treasurer? I know you always answer, of course, you got lots of money, but why does he have a treasurer? Any other reasons? Remember, Judas Iscariot was his treasurer. Mm. And in fact, if we were some of us that were operating the administration for Jesus, mm. we would not have chosen Judas to be the treasurer. Mm. <laughs> so, for the Lord, it is not just important to get a job, a job done. See, we humans are very goal-oriented. But for the Lord, both getting the job done and the privilege of the vessel doing the job are important. That is why it's a different concept altogether. And uh, like for example, like uh, uh, you know, thank God for uh, our sister. Can I call you by the new name now? Yes. Yeah. Stephen. Uh, Steffi. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Oh, it's oh, See? Okay, I'll let you guess that. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, uh, yeah. So, anyway. Ah, uh, yeah, Jerusha. Okay. Okay. So, then, uh, uh, so all oh, they look blurred now. Okay. Thank you for all waking up right now, tonight. And uh, so, um, so, uh, like, like, for example, like, Bible study, we just take three, four, five songs, right? Mm. I could have done a few songs and then go Bible study. Mm. 
uh, why don't I do it? Uh, and as you know, sometimes on Sunday I lead worship also. After I take over, I still lead worship. Because I love to worship. And I love to bring people a bit deeper uh, into the worship. And uh, although Mark has been doing a wonderful job, and uh, but uh, uh, everyone, uh, everyone brings the worship. You will always bring the worship to where you are spiritually. So whenever I lead a worship, I continue worship. It's not because uh, of anything. It's because I need the worship to take on my character before I preach a minister. So everyone always ministers from their, from their character. And it puts their DNA into the worship. And that's the importance of it. And, uh, so because it puts a different DNA into it, uh, that's why it feels different also. The anointing is always there. It feels different. And uh, uh, the reason being why we have different people do different things is not just to get the job done. If I want to get a job done, I could just select, you know, one person to do it all the time. But it's because of the vessels being trained in the process. And so, when Jesus selected Judas Iscariot, do you think Jesus was just interested in the administration of the finances? Or was Jesus also interested in the training of Judas? So obvious. So obvious, huh? oh, the answer is so obvious. So, it's for the training of Judas Iscariot, right? There, there could be a lot. You remember, one of his disciples was a tax collector? Under normal circumstances in any company, he would be a log logical person to select. After he handle money, right? he's a tax collector. Uh, he has been handling money all the time. He would be the logical person. Uh, now. Everything that we do for God, no matter how small, from doing the little thing of the sound, doing ushering, all those things, are little things in which God tests and trains us. Yes, there could even be training from the Lord. From the human side, not much to train, you know, just great people. But from the Lord's side, the Lord is watching how your heart functions and how you can grow. And then once in a while, the Lord sends a test. You say, how does the Lord send a test when you're just doing a simple thing? Who can persecute an usher? <laughs> well, it's, it so happened God can send it, uh, uh, God can allow a very uh, troublesome person to deal with, to come and approach you. And that was your test. In everything, God is interested in the job and in the person doing the job. Because they think very logically like that. Even before us, there were a lot of people who are effective in winning souls. Before all of us came into uh, Christianity and the ministry. Spring Vickers' word, John G. Lake, and all this. All God had to do is let them live longer until the whole world is warm. They can do the job finished. The rest of us just say, Hallelujah, we agree. Why does God let him die? And then goes to start all working with someone. Or people like Catherine Kuhlman. Then she died. And then goes to start all over again raising another person who has a vision of miracles or the burden for miracles. It looks like hard work because God is not interested in getting the job done. If he really wanted to get a job done, he would use his angel. We human just step aside. You would say, ah, you're so slow. Step aside. And the angel's finished. The whole world will be finished. But it's because it's the process of training us too. Mm -hmm. However, the question on why God, why Jesus get a treasure is not fully answered. And it's very hard to answer. And uh, recently, having dialogue with Jesus and seeing more glimpses into his life, we got a little glimpse into it, uh, the panorama of the New Testament. And the panorama of the New Testament, which we re uh, released, uh, we mentioned about how when Jesus was working as a carpenter, he would uh, sometimes uh, on uh, he went for a few trips outside of uh, Nazareth, and uh, during the few trips, altar building trips, you know how he supported himself. He has a carpenter's back. Did you describe the back in uh, no? I didn't. 
You don't remember the bag, eh? It has it is a it is a brownish color leather bag that Jesus had with him. Hey, Jesus called him back. Not when he was in ministry, but when he was a carpenter. And uh, and the little bag that he takes is a little carpenter's bag with all the carpenter's tools. And in his auto building trip during the time when he was about 26, 27, 28, 29, before 30, Jesus used to go to different places and build altar. Jesus still need to eat. Uh, he may not eat, but he, he ceremonially need to eat. He eat very little though. Uh, he need a shelter over his head, although he don't mind sleeping anywhere. And Jesus would uh, go to a place and he would be led by the Spirit and he would know some people who need carpentry land. And he worked in their place for lodging and food. And here's the thing I notice when I keep looking at very carefully what Jesus was trying to show me. During his entire life, he never touched money. Remember a tax collector came during his ministry? He asked Peter to do it. It's like money, it's like Jesus did not, as he was symbolic also of God. And he did not want to touch anything or have anything to do with anything the humans invented. Well, his standard was higher. I did not say that we have to live that way. Because if we all live that way, <laughs> think about all the things you don't have right now. Okay. First thing to go is a computer and laptop and, 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 your, and your phones. Uh, but Jesus was a resemblance of like, it's like, it's like he would be like an angel just transferred from heaven. And he lived like on earth, just using natural things. I said, why do you do that, Lord? The Lord says, to show forth the difference between the world and heaven, which is one of our topic today. The world and heaven. Even in its symbolism. It doesn't mean that we just touch money or, 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 or use money, it is wrong. Obviously, Paul uses money. Paul worked for money. Uh, and Paul rented a house in Acts uh, chapter 28. Uh, things that Jesus doesn't do. But the people of the world, including Christians who are in the world, who operate in the world, we need organization. Uh, we need registration. We need to register a church. We need to uh, sign contracts for uh, buildings or, 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 or buy buildings and all that in the future. So all those things. <coughs> But Jesus withdrew from all those things. And I was surprised when the Lord showed me that throughout his whole life, he never used money. He never used money. How did the people pay him in a carpenter shop? He just said, oh, just pass the money, pass the money to my brothers. <clears throat> he wouldn't handle it. Jesus would not even own a wallet for money. I said, whoa, I did not say that we are going to do this, right? <laughs> That's too extreme Christianity. But I want you to know the extent that Jesus took it. I said, I said Lord, why don't you, you know, use money and handle money and, and you work not even, you don't want even to work for money. It's almost like Jesus gave his work free and then they gave their food and lodging free back to him. Because <coughs> Jesus says, he is a symbol of heaven. Money is invented by man. And anything that was touched by humans in different extent, something Jesus doesn't really involve at all. He does not even want because he focused on heaven. Now, we don't have to go as extreme as him. Because he is, there is only one Jesus. Uh, he is, uh, in everything that he do was a symbol. Even where he chose to give birth. Everything was a symbol. And there is only one Jesus. However, we need to learn from his principles. How on the earth, we must have a detachment 
from the world and express it out as much as we can without neglecting our responsibilities and our stewardship of finances and money. Now, the people in the Bible handle money. And the fact that handling money is not wrong because Jesus told Peter to handle the taxes. Obviously, it needed to be done. But there is, as we enter into the end time, there is a lot of things that we need to understand that we have to stay away from the things of the world. Uh, you become more and more as we progress in this glorious church. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 17. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer was like a summary to show forth how unworthy he expects us to be. Yes, the way is unworthy. And you all have Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It tells you to present your body as a living sacrifice. Uh, and, uh, then, so, and then uh, let your mind be transformed and do not be conformed to the world. Do not the world. Do not be like the world, we are told. And uh, you all know that was in Romans 12, verse 2. But uh, here are ones that are not so often used. In John chapter 17, Jesus says here in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the man whom you have given me out of the world. Out of the world. We are people given out of the world. They were yours, you have given them to me, and they have kept your word. So, we now belong to Jesus. John 17 is especially about the glorious church. How unworthy we must become. And indeed, not only will God help us to become more unworthy and more heavenly, unworthy is a negative side, but the positive side is more heavenly. But I have to sometimes use the negative because negative things sometimes strike people stronger. Be unworthy, then you know what it means. Because uh, sometimes you talk about heavenly, people don't realize being heavenly is being unworthy. Uh, not like the world, not conform to the world. And uh, so remember, we were taken out of the world. We were supposed to be taken out of the world and given especially to Jesus. He is only talking about his bride, especially. Particularly his disciples, his bride. And uh, then he says, uh, it was night. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Well, this is strong statement. He doesn't care about the system in the world, the things of this world, because they are subject to God anyway. Although the Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, we know that that was John 3 16 referred to people. God didn't just send His Son for the sand and the oceans and the mountains. The words refers to people. And this unworthiness, I believe that as we enter more in the last days, as the wheat separated, separate from the test, you know how you can recognize the test and the wheat? Besides their fruit, and before their fruit came, can, can be manifest, we will be heavenly and unworthy. Tests are worthy. And looking only for the things of this world. Because their heart is not born in heaven yet. And more and more the differentiation will come. We have lived so long in this modern Christianity of nearly 200 years in fact, over 100 years of the 20th century, has made Christianity more worldly. Until today, we cannot differentiate between a worldly Christian and a spiritual Christian. We see the two as one. There are many churches from the pulpit that are preaching. Success from the world equals spirituality. Isn't that what they're preaching today? So in that way, you cannot differentiate spirituality from worldliness anymore. The two are so linked. 
We have confused some principles in the Bible. Yes, spiritual principles will bring you prosperity and worldly success. Obviously, we got scriptures for that. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Psalm chapter 1, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to 14. Obviously. But yet, while you have all those success, your success is only a side effect for you. Was Job a worthy man? No. He was super successful. Remember, Job was the richest man in the East. Was Abraham a successful rich man? Yes. But was he worthy? No. Was Daniel a successful man? Yes. Was he worthy? No. Was David a successful man? He was. Was he worthy? No. You know what most of his money he set aside for? The temple. Most of his wealth was invested in the temple that Solomon was going to build. He spent his lifetime accumulating wealth to be used for God. And again, let's be practical about it. I tell, I tell this often. How much money do you need to live? Actually, not that much. You do need money to live. But up to a certain level, it's only about better food, better housing, better transportation, better clothes, correct? It's only uh, those things. You don't actually need a lot of money to live. You need sufficient. In each country, there is always you know, different things and the costs are different. But why then do people keep striving for millions and millions? Now they know the end time is coming. And a lot of them, when they hear this message, and even this message will go all over the world. And they're asking them, why are you still saving money for your great-grandchildren? Your wealth should be for yourself, have sufficient for your loved ones and family to take care of them, but not excessively. And then, the rest used for the kingdom of God. Because you cannot take it home with you. You will have no reward if you die leaving one billion dollars in a bank, and your whole life you have only given to God ten million. You know that one billion is not counted in heaven. Only that ten million was counted, and God says you have given ten million. Of course, if they have been given the right attitude. Unworthiness is not much preached in today's church because we cannot differentiate anymore. But this is the message of the end times. The heavenly man. And the fact is this. People are afraid to be unworthy because they fear that by being spiritual. They have seen a lot of spiritual people. <coughs> They are poor like church mice. Maybe poorer than the church mice. At least the mice think got the fur and the coat to keep them warm. You have to look at wrong example. Look at the Bible example. Every spiritual man was well provided for, including Jesus Christ. So we have taken that truth in the 20th century and instead of emphasizing on heaven, we emphasize on worldly success. It is like getting a car and saying, you know, actually, you know what makes the car go? The wheels. Of course, the wheels have to, have to move. But the wheels of the car are not what run the car. The heart of the car is in the engine. It's the engine that generates the propulsion system. So it's the same way to say, you know, that worldly success is the aim. Don't aim at that. Aim at being heavenly and spiritual. Worldly success is the wheels, the side effect. Alright. Well, let's read on in John chapter 17. It says here, and uh, we read verse 9 just now, I do not pray for the world. Then in uh, chapter 17, uh, verse 11, Now I am no longer in the world. 
But these are in the world, talking about his disciples and also pointing to us. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Now, the Father is in heaven. In, heaven, in fact, heaven is made from the Father. Jesus is in heaven. When you're one with Jesus, and you're absolutely one, you cannot have one atom of worldliness. You can live in the world, but you cannot have even one atom of worldliness. And uh, when will I preach a message? Or the next Sunday, I'll preach about uh, how every time you contact the world, there is something of the frequency of the world that creeps on you. And you need to know how to, what Jesus means by the washing of feet. How to keep yourself clean, spirit, soul, and body. And this coming Sunday, I'll teach about uh, how the, the laws of cleanliness in the Old Testament transfer into the New. We still have laws of cleanliness in the New Testament, but they operate at a different level. There's a way that we could observe not just holiness, but the laws of unclean and clean. Remember, the moment you touch and do things on the world, it is unclean. Now we come back to this fact. You know why Jesus don't want to touch money? The concept itself is unclean to heaven. Oh, quickly throw away your money. <laughs> <laughs> no. haven't, you, uh, uh, haven't you read the verse where filthy lucre? Do you know that is in the Bible? Paul used that word. Uh, it's an old word, but it means it's like there's a smell of the world on it. Do you know heaven don't need money? It's invented on this earth. We need to use it on this earth when you live on this earth. But Jesus was so symbolic that he doesn't want to be angry. That's right. There was a message inside. I by all means, handle all the money. doesn't mean that, no. After that, we've got no more volunteers to count money. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, come, 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 become more money. No, but, uh, but the symbolism of it. We need to be aware so that you don't let the frequency slowly eat you up. Which means if you spend your life thinking about money, budgeting is good, I budget. I always cut the code according to the clock. I always, you know, economize according to what you have. It's important. It's important to be responsible. It's important to budget. It's important to, to live within your means. However, too much of it makes you hungry. When you begin to think, oh, how do I spend money? What do I do? And that is too much. It's too much. There is a line which we were not aware there's a line. Until Jesus began to show me his life and I say, Well, you really kept from the world. Because Jesus was teaching me not just about holiness. See, this revival is holiness. But in holiness, Jesus was just teaching me about being clean and unclean. Remember he when he washed Jesus, Jesus when he washed. Peter's feet. He says, Peter says, wash him, and he says, he that is washed is already clean. Then he says, but not all of you are clean. In buying Judas is scary. And then Jesus would turn around and say, this you will do to one another. Besides a message of humility, there's a message about every time you go out into the world, you must wash your feet. That means every time you have gone to work, when you come back, don't just walk late. Ah, oh, what, 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 what do the things of work? And you come back, plop, plop. The frequency of the world is still in you. That is why you cannot ascend to heaven. You are like a chicken that has forgotten how to fly. Only good enough for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, have you seen chickens that can fly? Kentucky Fried Chicken. Most of the chickens are raised. 
battery hang. You let those chicken up, the unit cannot fly high. But you go to some kampong somewhere, some village somewhere, oh, those chickens can fly to the tree. Because they are different type of chicken. They have a genealogy. <laughs> been bred out there. And their wings have been used, well used. And you chase those chickens. I remember, you know, long ago you chase the chicken. You're surprised. Oh, chicken goes to the tree. Never thought chicken can fly to the tree. Of course, they can't fly like the eagle, but they still can. Uh, when we are in this earth, we need to realize there are some things you can touch and handle, but not too much. Not too much. To overdo will give you a frequency of the world. And then hard to ascend up. Let's finish reading John 17. And it says, um, yeah, um, let's jump to some of the verses. Verse 14. I have given them your word. And he didn't say the devil. He didn't say the fallen angels. He didn't say the demon. And he says, the world. You know this thing? The world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. Does the world hate you? Oh, the other one love you. You're too close to it. I don't say that you purposely make the world hate you. You know, you stand out there, come on, world, hate me! Fulfill this picture! I didn't ask you to do that. Same way, don't go out and purposely look for persecution. But if you're if I, if you cannot if we cannot differentiate between you and the world. You are the world. In fact, there's a song very famous that always say, We are the world. <laughs> Use every time they need fundraising or some campaign somewhere. We are the world. You know? That's not our song. Definitely not our song. We are citizens of heaven. Not that we don't get involved on this thing of this. Uh, we only get involved as much as is necessary. And that's all. Not too much. Not too much. It's just that people ask me, you know, um, uh, do you buy insurance? <laughs> Why you think I'm so spiritual, I don't buy insurance. No, I need car insurance. And, uh, and some insurance are necessary. So, uh, I buy it when it's necessary, when it's compulsory, when it's compulsory. Uh, and uh, so that was a particular trip that was very funny. I forgot one of those trips somewhere. And uh, then some, you know, when you buy airline tickets, I ask you whether you want insurance or not. And uh, it depends on the culture you grow up in. Say from a third world country, getting the ticket was already good enough. But when you grow up in a first world country, the insurance and component is part of it. Yeah. And, and, but I don't have to buy it because if, of course you, you buy your ticket with your credit card, it really comes with the insurance. So you try to minimize your expenditure. Uh, but sometimes for practical reasons, uh, uh, when, I, when I sense that there is a possible case of some delay of flight thing, then I will just add a little insurance so that it covers you for that. And uh, so far it hasn't happened, but uh, sometimes, uh, occasionally. So do I buy insurance? Yes, but you don't buy insurance excessively. Of course, now some people are selling insurance going to come after me. Hey, Pastor Days, I would like to know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sorry folks. I'm, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, the people of the world need lots of insurance. <laughs> you got what clientele out there, and uh, so uh, here's the thing. Okay, here's a little joke that those of you selling insurance. Would you have sold insurance to Jesus? 
啊，有个男生，有 laughing， 有一个男生，啊，问题是买 insurance。<笑> Thank you very much. Okay, Jesus is in children. Okay, I believe was in children. Okay, very good. He doesn't need underwriter or anything. <laughs> the father actually underwrite him. <laughs> uh, the father in church, Jesus. <laughs> anyway, that's a thing. But uh, in everything, there is balance. There is such a thing as too much. There is such a thing as too much. Like for example, how much clothes do you all have in your cupboard? Mm -hmm. Do you think too much, too little? How many pairs of shoes do you have? Too much, too little? <laughs> now, the definition of too much, too little is different for everyone. I could go to your house and say, what's this hundred pairs of shoes doing here? <laughs> and say, hey, this is just nice. <laughs> okay, fine. And, uh, and always I give a little bit of allowance for ladies, sometimes, you know. I, uh, uh, it was one of those dinner conversations in Australia. And then I think it was a basket. And he was commenting on another uh, the girl or sister saying, No, she buy one more bag. One more bag. And if you know Sebastian or Sebastian, in, not this Sebastian here, Sebastian in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Sydney. Well, he counts. He's a counter. He's, he comes from a, a lineage of shopkeepers. I used to taste the deal. Every time we go out together, I'll say, you know, it's the best thing you charge the bill. <laughs> and everyone pay to him. And he will count by the cents. You know. Bill, $15, $15, $15.60, cents, whatever. And so, and so I say, Sebastian, you know, ladies give some allowance. They need at least, uh, you know how many colors are there in the rainbow? Seven. Okay. And then, plus a few shades. So, uh, you know, they, their bags are part of their dressing. <laughs> for men, for what I meant, uh, uh, the only thing your husband not here to hear your arm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, so, so I say, give a bit of allowance. Uh, ladies, you know? And their shoes is also part of their clothes. Mm -hmm. they men. That's why I, I wear black shoes most of the time. Because it matches with any color. <laughs> and uh, so I got a lot of spare shoes. They are still wrapped up because the design goes off. So when I buy, they say, okay, this is going to run out once I get used to this type of thing, so I keep it there. But I only open two at a time. Of course, now that I got two places, I got two here and two in, uh, in, uh, in fact, one in Sydney, two here. So one for official wear, one for unofficial wear. And, uh, and uh, so so I wear the same thing when I go out eating and all that. I notice, of course, my dressing is different from some of you. You know, some of you, you might have only one flip flops <laughs> <laughs> for everything. But uh, there is such a thing as too much. Mm. And this is a wonderful thing. As we grow in the Lord, you need less and less. Mm. Less and less. Once a year, just go through your clothes, see those things you don't wear, and, and that is also a reminder for me to do it. And uh, take those things you never wear, you know, just give it away. Give it away. Or if you need hard cash, you know, just give it to someone, sell it on eBay or whatever. Who knows, you know, somebody might, might, might be, be, be for your thorn and get the cheese you know, or something. So, whatever. And there's such a thing as too much. And so, Jesus says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That's in, uh, and in verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And um, then he treats the world as something separate. You know, the world hates. The world naturally hates. This has not happened much in the 20th century as Christians get more and more worldly. They are so worldly now, they get into a lot of worldly things. But the day is coming. Even in America, the day is coming when it will be unlawful to preach the gospel. Yes, in America. During the time, close to the time of the Civil War. In the midst of the Civil War. And so the time is coming that way. 
and you need to be bold in what the Lord asks us to do. And this are just to illustrate uh, this uh, area of worldliness, how, how unworldly we are. And the world is a separate thing, like we are witnessing to the world, we are sent out there into the world. There are many other places in chapter 17 but that I won't read. But let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, If you then, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. This rhymes with Matthew chapter 6, which you all know very well. Jesus said, do not worry about food, clothing, and shelter. He mentioned, do not worry so many times. He says, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't, don't, don't worry, worry. He says, don't be like the people of the world. We are different. We learn to give thanks for whatever we have. If you live in a little rented room, Praise the Lord. If you live in your own apartment, praise the Lord. If you live in a more uh, uh, upmarket apartment, praise the Lord. If you have or you don't have, praise the Lord. See, heavenly people are not affected. Plus, heavenly people, and these are the qualities of heavenly people. Number one, heavenly people are not affected by what you have and what you don't have on the earth. Correct? Because you're heavenly. It doesn't affect you. It doesn't make you anxious, doesn't make you uh, uh, cry, weep, desire, moan, want to fast 14 days so that you can have a better apartment. <laughs> Wasting energy. Say, so cannot fast 40 days. Huh? Can fast 40 days. But in the 40 days, spend 5 minutes on getting the other apartment. <laughs> but the, all the rest of 40 days, then you may grow and be like Jesus. See, a lot of people waste energy in the wrong thing. They go on crusades. They waste energy. And we go only X amount of energy, X amount of time. And it is important to keep this focus. We are not affected. You, and you don't get emotional. Don't get emotional when a meteorite accidentally comes and hit your beloved car. <laughs> In the first place, how dare you use beloved for cars? <laughs> and if you cry because your beloved car got wrecked, you are too emotionally attached to it. If you cry when you when when you lose a place to stay, you're too affected by the world. You've gone too much emotionally into the world. Uh, no. So there are certain things that when you live free from them, this is a way we are teaching you. Live free from emotional attachment to the things of this world. So you have them, fine. You don't have them, fine. Praise the Lord. Your happiness doesn't depend on those things. Well, finally, you were here. She was waiting for you. <laughs> to hear a special message that she wanted you to hear. And I might as well give it to her, not speak to her on your behalf. She actually gave me the instruction before you came. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 then she can as, man as many bags as she wants. <laughs> so, anyway. But, uh, basically... Uh, we must release. And tonight, those of you who hear this word, let go emotionally. I didn't say let go legally. <laughs> I didn't say let go physically. You can still hold on to your money or assets you have. But please, let go emotionally. And that's the reason why you couldn't live in heaven. Because every time you try to fly, then God wants to bring it, oh, <laughs> fall back. I wonder what 
least that. Then you try again. And then you pray, you fast, you go. The, the frequency comes, the heavenly frequency that makes you want to vibrate. Change your specific gravity and you vibrate. We learned about frequency in the last week. <laughs> Something pulls you back. And you wonder what is that? And you can't see the string that keeps pulling you back. You know why? Invisible to you. See, how can the world can be seen? No. Because camouflage. You're so used to seeing the world as neutral. So you can't see the string that tie you to the world. Until you become heavenly, you can see the umbilical cords that people tie to the world. You know the worst case scenario? They are even departed dead humans who are so tied to earth when they die and they, they don't deserve hell yet, they are in the intermediate realm one. They are still bound to the earth. Some of them are actually, at this much a ghost man or something, right? <laughs> Some of them are actually still walking around, going to work, come back, going to their house, come back. Their house already sold three, four owners. And they still think their house and they still come and go back. And they still go to their place of work. And you know, they feel like they're in a dream. The thing they forgot is they never eat. So their ghost man, maybe they face it. <laughs> Then they remember the E, but whatever. And they are so worldly, they die, they're still stuck on the earth. They're still stuck here. They are called earthbound spirits. They are not demons. Earthbound spirits. If you got spiritual eyes and the Lord opens you, you see them once in a while. You see them once in a while. Still. Some of them, time has passed. Hundred years have passed. In fact, in the United States uh, White House, when we were there, right, there is actually, uh, let me see how many there were. Three, I saw three. But there was one, I forgot what year, I think it was in the 1600s. So, no, 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 I forgot what it was. Eh? There was, no, no, the United States is only 200 years old, right? So it cannot be that far back. And, uh, but there's one of their, their presidents who died many, many, now it's about their number 40 something. So he would be around probably number 17 in the teens thing. He's so unbound, he's still there. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't deserve help, but he's still there, hanging around the White House. So there are a lot of unbound spirits that sometimes I see. I say, what is this guy doing here? And the angels are trying to get them to, to go to school in the spiritual realm. And they say, not going. So about. So you think that there are such humans like that, how much more when they're still alive? The state and the condition of people. And we need tonight detach emotionally from the world. The world doesn't stir your emotionally. Your, I mean, your emotion doesn't, your, your happiness doesn't depend on that. that. That's the first thing about uh, being heavenly. You're not affected. And you don't pursue those things uh, on this earth. Yes. Uh, because the spiritual boundary cross very right low. Where is hell? Hell is inside the earth, right? So be, from, from the earth, all the way to the uh, heaven are spiritual planes. So they are at the earth plane level. It is two dimension. We humans are here. There's a dimension of spirit. Yeah. So between here to hell are many, many dimensions also. There's the outskirts of hell area also, I call it. Different dimension. Yes. You're talking about tests or what? Okay. Uh, tests will never ever be weak. But uh, there are a lot of people not born yet, born again yet. So they're not considered either tests or weak. They're just like uh, the harvest is ripe for harvesting. And they're just waiting for them to be receiving the gospel. Yeah. 
So, that's a that's speed of it. Yes, sir. So the motion is not. So you're saying that the, the source of the motion is that we have emotions ourselves, right? But it's your motion. Is it mean that how our emotions are affected, what source they what is the source of the our emotions? Is that you're explaining that the, when the world thinks of the thing our emotions, that will bring us down? Yes. And then, but then we also be able to put our emotions from the heavenly part. Correct. Remember, our soul has a mind, emotions, and will. Those three things don't waste on the world. This world is a passing world. Remember what the Bible calls this world? Uh, Peter calls it a mist that passes away soon. So everything in this world is a mist. They're not real. Don't waste emotions on that. The energy and emotion give to something more precious. The loved ones. Your loved ones. They are more precious than money, silver and gold, correct? To love another person, to love your family, to love your loved one, to love uh, your disciples, to love those whom you are helping, to love people, that's a better investment for your love. You must love, I always say, people, no, the world got it wrong. The world love things and use people. We love people and we use things. Things are to be used. And when it's not used, you just offer it for use. Like on Sunday, the, the, you know, where I got the spare guitar. Uh, Mark plays the guitar. That's my personal guitar. So, uh, the church has its own guitar. But I say, no, we're sitting there and I, I, it's an honor for me to see it being used for worship. Correct. So, things are to be used. Things are to be offered to the Lord. For it to be used. Uh, so, when, when things are used, people are loved. That's a the correct uh, way to invest your emotion. Uh, so you can tell whether people are worthy or not by, you know, uh, in some of these areas. We are, there's a detachment. Uh, heavenly people, they are different from the people of the world. They have a detachment from this world. And of course, second point, heavenly people have to have heavenly encounters. There has to be, it has to be as real to you as here. And I'll talk about it after towards the ending the application side. How to, heaven is real and is interacting in your life right now. And especially now God sends an energizing, more energizing. There are more heavenly things intersecting onto this earth. And there's several other uh, points that are there. Uh, one of those things I mentioned that when there are things that are invisible that are more valuable than things that are visible. And heavenly people can differentiate that. Uh, like the concepts of love, care, or kind words spoken. Do you know that in heaven, when you go, to, even when you're, when you're out in things that you, you didn't know God is watching you or God recording your life all the time, when you're out, let's say, in the MRT, or, or when you're there and you're queuing, and then you're rude to someone just because they got too close. Well, all those things not bad example. Then when you're just being kind to somebody, or you know, you help a, a, a person that nobody was helping, maybe the person stumbled and fall and you went to help. I think one time I was in the MRT, and uh, then uh, this person fainted. Yeah, it must be fair. I cannot be falling under the power. I was not praying that much. And, <laughs> and uh, so this person in front, you know, fainted. that. So the first thing is, you know, uh, natural thing was, I quickly grabbed the person's uh, uh, back because it was going all over the place. And then a uh, good thing, another young man also was there. And, uh, he, you know, he's, he's kind of weak. So since the person is doing the job, so I don't, don't intervene. Uh, just hold the person stinks. 
So others the things all scattered. Then when finally this person got up and then they called up, they got this person a chair, then pass this person things like that. Small little things. Important. Because people are more important than things. And here's the thing. Your journey is as important as the destination. Change your life. Our life is always so goal-oriented. You know what goal-oriented people? It's good to be goal-oriented. If you know me, you know I'm very goal-oriented. But my goals are spiritual goals. My goals are spiritual goals. You never hear me talking about having a goal of what kind of car I drive, what kind of house I live, and all those things. You never hear me. Those are not my goals. Those are fringe benefits. Of course, you know, as the church grows and all that, as things prosper, you know, you have a reasonably good car, but I really make my choice. I definitely will not have top, 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 top of the range. So goodbye Lamborghini, <laughs> goodbye Mercedes, goodbye BMW. I will, most of all, I'm quite happy with Volvo, right? So, or when they invent electric cars, I'll be interested in those things. And we might have our own car factory next time, those six billion people, right? So, but it is important for us to understand that when a person is fairly goal-orientated, they can lose sight of everything. And too goal-orientated becomes selfish. You know why? It's my goal. So you get in the way. Because you're in the way of my goal. But remember, the goal is destination. The journey is as important. You want to reach the destination doing the right thing. If you keep doing the wrong thing to reach the destination and you finally reach the destination by hook or by crook, you really want to go too hard on the lake system. By hook or by crook, you reach a destination. When you reach a destination by all the worst and terrible things, guess what you become? You become a devil. Each time you do something bad, you become more devilish, more devilish, more devilish. Finally, congratulations, you got your destination, but you also have become a devil. You want to reach your destination and become an angel. By doing all the right things. And then you reach your destination because you are being transformed. Remember my first question that I asked you, why did God choose Judas Iscariot to be treasurer? is to train his character. Because Jesus was not interested in the job alone. Because you only get a good job done, the better person was Matthew. But he was interested in the journey. The act of doing something would change Judas, hopefully. Judas just, Judas only interested in himself. He's a typical self-absorbed person. And the thing about this world is this world has a lot of typical self-absorbed people who are successful, who write books, who conduct seminars, and they teach more self-absorbed people. And because people are caught in this rat race, don't join the rat race. Because if you join it, there's no way out. They will keep changing your goal. Haven't you noticed that, that the computers keep on improving, the power keep on doubling? Everything get done, but the price always the same. You know why? They still want to sell it back to that price. Even though they can sell you the old one and they could the old one old price because they want the profit margin that is there. And so it's always thousands of days. When will the computer ever become ten dollars? Will it ever? And die? Will it be as cheap as buying an apple? Although it's named an apple today. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, because they try to keep that range. And the same way, it is a red race. They keep changing the goals. Once, when you come up, they say, you know, your goal is to have your house, your car. Then after you have your house, your car, you want a better house, a better car. Then, better house, better car, no good. Better house, better car, better suburb. And then, after that, they keep on changing. The red race keep on going round and round. Until, you know, dying also dies, still changing something. 
there was one particular incident as a pastor in Malaysia one time, and uh, I was, I was talk, talking with, we conducted many, 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 many funerals and many weddings. And uh, so uh, one day I did not conduct, but one of the members, uh, relative, relative, really, uh, distant, they told me this story, a true story. So it's about the third witness account. It says one of their uh, relations died, and uh, they, they, that day they, they were asking about what kind of physical they can do or cannot do. And he said, and this person died, and he's not really a rich person, generally wealthy, but not rich rich probably middle class rich, says, dying, you know the last breath of this person? And we speak Hokkien or, or Chinese, say, Lui, 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 which is means money, 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 up to the last breath, still one more money. Think about all the multi-billionaires. You know, if you're a billionaire, you cannot spend enough today, more than enough. Still want more money. Still want more money. What's that for? To change the world. To be known as a change of the world, right? Then they're after fame. Something of the red race that is reinvented for you to go after. In the first place, you're not alright. Don't go to the red race. We got another race, the one in Hirusha. It's called the sheep race. <laughs> how, how does the sheep race work? The sheep race doesn't work by all of us run, uh, uh, getting running against each other. Sheep race is how the sheep is changed and transforming the journey. The journey is as important as that. Now, yes. Besides Psalm chapter 1, Psalm chapter 1 is there also for family members and non-family members. Mm -hmm. Which means that if my family member is worldly, mm -hmm. uh, sit in the seat of the scornful, mm -hmm. I will not fellowship with them much. I come from a family of uh, six children. <coughs> my other sister is going to be a lot. My father is also going to be home to be with a lot. And uh, then uh, some of them now they got extended families and uh, all that. I, when I went into the ministry, I did not have much time to spend for family. And I understand the Bible says, love, you know, honor your, your, your father and mother kind of thing. I give them what I want, I could. Uh, but then we did, I have the other siblings who uh, are closer to them or uh, in the same, live in the same city. Uh, and um, so uh, I get close to my family depending on how spiritual they are. Of course, by now all of them born again. But still some of them, you know, when they, uh, when they get family issues, and they fight about money, fight about mom's money, fight about this and they are, goodbye, you know, no time for those things. And uh, you guys go and fight, I don't want to fight. Uh, I'm not even concerned. And uh, I would put in a few words of advice and all that. So my last trip that I went back and saw my brother was probably beginning of the year or something. And uh, so I gave him a good talk, and I said, look, you know, family is more important than money. So, uh, you know, don't get angry at this sister because of what this and that. You know, family is more important uh, than all those things. And so I would, I would minimize my contact with my family if my own family were worthy. You do what you call minimum necessary so you know that it's there. But then, after a certain age when you got your own family and you got all those things, it's understood that everyone uh, is separate. separate. 
and I have done my share last time when I used to bring all. I try to bring all of them together for meal, chit chat together, I know, whenever I can. But I will apply sounds one also to family. It sounds cruel, but Jesus made a statement, and Mary was not angry at Jesus. Uh, Mary just was new to Jesus' concept. Remember, it was made in the early part of Jesus' ministry. And so here is her son, Jesus, and uh, she, she loved him very much. And, she, and then there's this crowded house, uh, most likely in Capernaum. And of course, to get in, they just say, Thank Jesus, we are here. But Jesus is in the midst of ministry. Now, Jesus, one statement says, you know, who are my, my mother and who are my brethren? He says, those who do the will of God. Then he looked at the disciples and said, these are my mother and my brothers. But one statement changed Mary. She understood. When it came to God, God come first. And she cannot use her, re her re blood relationship with Jesus or relationship with Jesus to enter into any area of the uh, ministry wise. Which you'll find that in our church is the same thing. Not all senior pastors, you know, in church group, they all this thing. A lot of them, they are, they are family, their loved ones, you know, all carry weight. And as the church grows, they put everybody is kaki now. You know? Uh, Chinese words are ka kaki nan. Okay, so, right, right, in the organization. And uh, all in my family, family, all those things, and then all the board, all family members, <laughs> you know, all this uh, look like look like fam family dynast dynasty, because of my principles. If my children do not have the calling, they not involved. They will have their place. I will be a good father to them, and that's it. And and like always, I tell people, you know, I have a wife, but my wife is not past senior pastor. So don't bring all the problems through her, thinking go to her and come to me. You will get a big rebuke from me. Yeah. Then you'll learn your lesson. So, and you know, people are happier that way because they say, praise the Lord. He is running the church because he's anointed. Uh, otherwise, in some churches, the wife is running the church. Not the husband. And you wouldn't want me to make any church decisions based on something that I discuss based on the family thing. The church decision is to be based solely on church principles and Bible principles. That one, once people can trust, that's it, it's a different style of running, different leadership that comes forth. So, family is important and you need the, to fulfill God's covenant and blessing with that. To make sure that, you know, I, I always I make sure I say, hey, is somebody taking care of my mother there? You know, is she being cared for? Does she have enough? All those things. Basics. But still, sounds one is higher. Involved with friends are the same thing. With friendship, uh, the closer you come to God, you might lose some friends. Some friends just don't hang, hang out with you. Especially those who like to go out and pop on Friday night. And you say, sorry, now Friday got prayer. <laughs> <coughs> you go there, up, get drunk, in wine. We here, we get drunk with spiritual wine. <laughs> and so, different type of wine. So, this is our spiritual part, <laughs> which is a different thing. We, we hang around differently. And so, you might lose some friends, but you will gain some new ones. You will gain new ones. You will establish new ones. Hope that answer that question is a hard thing, and uh, I, at first it was hard for my family to accept it. Uh, but uh, they, you know, they accept it, and uh, then sometimes I pull a bit more distant, especially when I notice all the negative things coming. I pull a bit more distant. So I used to visit about once in three months, and I hear all these things. I say, okay, don't deserve my time. Not getting you know, until those things die, and uh, so yeah, wait 12 months, <laughs> uh, things like that. So, according to their walk with the Lord, uh, which is that, and uh, yes.
<laughs> Very interesting concept. In, in family, everyone, when we all die, families are dissolved, and there's only one big family with God. And everyone will go to their spiritual level. So if within the same family, people are different levels, they will all go to different levels, and they will enjoy it better, because it is a suffering, and it is a, it runs against the grain, uh, to have people of different glory living under the same mansion. Yeah. They cannot take the light. They can communicate, can visit any night, but different levels. Different levels. Now, to get to the point of the solution today, I got one more question, then I go to the other point. Here's a way, here is another interesting one. You remember my first question, right? Why they got appointed G Judas? Behind the why the Lord teaching, he's training Judas. He's not interested in the job. Money he can have any night. Even if even Judas keep all his money, he still got more money coming. So money is like nothing to Jesus. Although we need to be a good steward, okay? Don't jump overboard. But he's detached emotionally. And uh, then the, my next question is this. You all remember the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That when Adam and Eve ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil, something happened. Bang! Right? Okay. Here's my question. When Adam and Eve ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they realized that they were naked and all this thing, the knowledge of evil came. Did the knowledge of evil came from the fruit they ate or from the breaking of God's command, which has nothing to do with the fruit they ate? In, in, other, in other words, the fruit actually impart knowledge, right? Tree of knowledge impart knowledge, tree of life impart life. So you expect that when they ate, something was imparted. So did that impartation came from the tree itself, that realization? that they were naked, the knowledge of sin, or did it come from, they remember, ah, God told me not to do this. Yes. Breaking. Okay, when they broke the law, the laws are covering. Then, did the tree give them anything? Zero? Yes, that's what my question is. Did the tree give them anything? Yes? Yes? And then they take the tree, they were connected to something else. Now, if they, if let's say, uh, nobody touched a tree or anything, an angel come and eat from the tree, I've told God, I always say angels cannot eat. Right? Yeah. Him and take one tree. Would that tree have imparted something good? Yes. In other words, was the tree of knowledge a good and evil? Good. It's a good tree. Oh, thank you very much. It must be good because God made it. Yeah, yeah. yeah in the heaven, it's a good tree. Good tree, yeah. yeah. Heaven, very good tree. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, so, what did the good tree give? Because it broke the law. Then, the something if they did not break the law, mm. you mean God allowed them to eat the tree, then when they partake, right? You yes. give them better juice. Knowledge? Juice. <laughs> 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 it were given them knowledge. Right? It were given them knowledge. It's a tree of knowledge, actually. Mm. Adam cannot handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like from the movie. <laughs> He can't handle the truth. <laughs> okay, so Adam couldn't handle the knowledge. Yes, but the tree actually imparts something. That means after he ate, the tree did give him something. Yeah, the eyes were open. See, the tree opened their eyes, but their eyes were not supposed to be open yet. <laughs> good. Very good thinking. Continue. <laughs> Premature. Yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. Now. Correct. Now. 
There is still a tree of knowledge there. Mm. It just be in another dimension. Can we now still eat of the tree? Yes. Ah. Now. Now. It's, it's by the snake. Oh, the tree is enclosed by the snake. Okay, that's something new. <laughs> some scriptures to you and ask you a, a question that you might not have been asked before. In Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, when God made everything that was there, in verse 29, verse 29, and this is after God made Adam and Eve in verse 27, so it's recorded two times. So in verse 29, God says, See, I have given you every herb that you see, which is on the face of all the earth. And every tree whose fruit you see to you, it shall be for food. Do you notice the word? Every tree. Then, in verse 30, To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which is life, I have given every green herb to eat. Uh, especially note the verse in verse 29. Can you see the word every tree? Mm -hmm. Every tree whose fruit you see, to you it shall be for fruit. And looks like God let them actually uh, eat every tree. Mm -hmm. Then in chapter 2, when God made man in verse 16. This is before the woman came. In verse 16. The Lord commanded the man saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now when you contrast chapter 1 to chapter 2, here's the thing. In chapter 1, did God say he, they can eat every tree? Then in chapter 2, he said every tree but did something happen between chapter 1 and 2? <laughs> Your Bible, you write many times. How many times have you read it? You never notice it. Right? God did say every tree in chapter 1. Every tree that bears fruit, fruit for you. Because of this, there is a wrong theory that comes. There are people who actually research and try to give answer. One of the wrong theories, wrong one, remember, this is the wrong one, is that God actually made Adam and a woman from the dust. And then that woman rebelled. And then the second one, chapter 2, God took from Adam's side. That became Eve. And they called that first one Lilith. So there was a Lilith before there was an Eve. And those who are trying to prove it look for the legends and the, and the myst mystical explanation of the Jews. The Jews do have a little story about Lilith. You read about Lilith, she was created before Eve. All these are nonsensical, wrong, X, 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 and cross, cross, cross. But we are still left with this thing. You have to explain about that tree. 
Why in chapter 1 can eat, chapter 2 can eat all but one? Hey? Something about rebellion, yes, something came. And that is why Sebastian gave a clue just now. He said, did he? When? So Sebastian should have the answer now, so tell me. <laughs> and he said that the tree and the serpent were like. Ah, okay, come on, is it? The answer is coming closer, getting warmer. Yes, you're getting warmer to the answer. Something happened. Yes. The devils infiltrated uh, the, the, the garden. The devil infiltrated the garden. Infiltrated. Oh, infiltrated, yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, infiltrated. How? He, he, he took, uh, he, he was, uh, the, I, I understood that the serpent was a top of the Yes, the serpent, remember I described what the serpent looked like. The serpent doesn't have a nose. He has two holes for the nose. And uh, the head is like no hair. And his tongue is blackish uh, fork. Uh, but it got, it got humanoid, got two arms, two legs. And walks. So the serpent. And that serpent was an infiltration from the rebellion. <coughs> eh? Eh? From the rebellion of Satan. But when what was Satan doing when God recreated the earth? Remember, this earth was his only quarter. He was watching, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. So the Bible doesn't tell us a lot of things the devil did. You only give clue. Suddenly, you got something in uh, Ezekiel 28. Uh, if you don't have Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, you wouldn't know the background of the devil. It's all hidden. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, do you know where we, where we get the story of one third rebellion? Not from Genesis. From Revelation chapter 12. It's the only scripture. Let me tell you. Is the only scripture that mentioned one third. And yet it's very well established in Christian Christian doctrine. But that's where the scriptures are. See, when you study doctrine, you need to know where the doctrine came from. The history of the doctrine, which verses support it, and, and all those things. Now, the devil was watching all those things. He was looking for a way to infiltrate. And he is not allowed to go in as a fallen angel, or send his fallen angel, or send all his kaki tangan. The devil took whatever from the fallen world, creatures, that are really fall, fell with them, put something up, and when God put all the animals in the kingdom, the devil put it. So it's like God created all the animals and all that. The devil, the, of course God, God could have stopped him. God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing. So the devil, you know, while, 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 while God was creating all the creatures there, you know, boom, 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 one shot off, the devil came and then slowly go, put one inside. <laughs> the serpent was Satan's creation. Satan cannot create. Satan's sort of twisted. Infiltrated. And this is what happened. Of uh, course, this one is extra biblical. But it doesn't contradict the Bible. It actually explains the difference between Genesis 1 and 3. And 2. And uh, the serpent ate from that tree of knowledge. Of course, I can eat the fruit. Right? God says it's for all the animals. Right? Because, yes. Because I remember Pastor shared that uh, the Adam naming the animals. Oh, this animal not named by Adam. So, so the snake doesn't have name yet. The snake doesn't belong to the. Doesn't belong to the farm. It's like Satan ruling it. 
And in fact, when Adam saw the serpent, he go, he like, he like in Malay we say the kajut for the wah. He was like, hey, where did this animal come from? And and he knew nothing to do with him. Because God doesn't make a horrible creature like that. However, because he's still part of God's original fallen world and all those things, God still control it and become the snakes today. That is why some of the leftover things and all that, like cockroaches, insects and all those things, you know, that the lower things, God just allow them to function. Eh? Heaven don't have them. They only exist on this fallen earth. <laughs> You all love cockroaches? No, no. <laughs> okay. When I say he, okay. So, and uh, so, after the serpent got that, God warned Adam. That tree do not eat. Because something changed when the serpent. Remember, the best thing you say something changed in the tree. Something changed when the serpent. Something changed. God says, not for you, because now God cannot create evil, correct? Mm -hmm. So originally it was a tree of knowledge of good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the the filthy hand go. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, this part I didn't see. All I know is that the serpent ate. Whether the serpent go, but somebody eating durian like that. <laughs> Have you seen people speak eating durian? <laughs> okay, speak eating a durian. <laughs> so, I know. Uh, Why one thing? It changed the tree and it changed the serpent. Yes. Ah, yes. Correct. Correct. <laughs> See, all this logic starts flowing. And then God says, uh, actually before the fall, Adam was supposed to get it. Mm -hmm. Remember God asked, give him a word. Tend it. To tend it. After all, there's nothing that needs to tend. Everything grows by itself. Mm -hmm. Behind the word tend is the word watch. He's to watch over it. And, yes? But Adam has not seen evil, that's why he otherwise the serpent. Correct. When he saw <laughs> the kajut, right? See? <laughs> he just didn't, want to, didn't know what to do with this guy. <laughs> he said, I'm not supposed to name him, but I don't know why he's walking around. But don't forget, in those days, open vision, he saw a lot of angels come and go, come and go, even God was walking around. So, so when the, this funny creature walked around, he said, Huh, interesting. Continue his work. And, by the way, the uh translation for those online? Shock. Shock, okay, thank you very much. Surprise. Yeah, shock or surprise for those online. And, uh, so, after that, God says, Do not eat. That explains a little difference. And why the tree is also now in chapter 2 called Good and Evil. Evil has touched it. It's not meant for the devil and the rebellion. But evil has touched it. And changed it. Now, remember the tree of knowledge you, you eat in the, your vision? Remember that one? Same tree. <laughs> Because he was he was very good. When he wrote the vision to me, I didn't tell him at that time. He says, uh, this one not the tree of knowledge, uh, not good evil, this tree of knowledge. <laughs> because he, he was describing it. Same tree. But when you eat it, it has a different effect because you can handle it now. We really know good and evil and you sense evil. Can you remember? You sense evil? <laughs> that was same tree. Good and evil. So in vision, God let him eat it. So when he eat it, he saw the evil happening on the earth. So yes, we can handle the tree now. The only tree we cannot handle is the tree of life. Except now in Jesus we can. Is that a 
related to chapter 3 when uh, Eve has an impression that we should not touch it. Yes. Yes. Correct. That's where it came from. That's where Adam says. And, uh, Adam didn't say that. Uh, Eve was the same. Oh, the Lord say, you know, we, we cannot eat away, we cannot touch it. Which, in a sense, is that? Because we never touch it before. Correct. We never can touch it. Yeah. So it's good to add the do not touch, which means it's good that if don't go around and say, wow, what nice leaves. <laughs> it's really very nice looking leaves. Yes. Correct. So now the creation story is slightly different. You thought that God just create, shh, then He put. After He create everything, I'm going to clear this afterwards. Just clear this. <laughs> okay. After He create everything, He put one tree. In a place where Adam can notice it, Eve can notice it, and every time they pass, because they remember that one cannot eat. All that one can eat, this one cannot eat. And it was only place to test him. It sounds a little bit small for God though. Yeah. So, but there is a story behind it. And all this you can get from the heavenly archives. Go to heaven. Go. Go more. Okay, I go to conclude how to access heaven. Right. No, you got many more questions reserved for October 18th. <laughs> And uh, write down in case you forgot. Every time people got a lot of questions, then when they're in front of me, after making, uh, take a long time to make an appointment, make an appointment, say, me, say, I don't have any questions at the moment. <laughs> they all blue. So, write down. Now, heaven intersects into this earth in, in the olden days before open vision was removed. Humans could access and see angels, heavenly angels to and fro, all these things happen. But as sin nature began to take over, Adam, after uh, the, the lineage of Adam after Noah's time, began to see less and less. But if you look into your, in your Bible, and we have done teachings on this before, God still reserves a way in which we access heaven, even in our fallen nature. Because it won't be fair if God didn't give us enough tools, correct? It's a very simple thing called dream. <laughs> dream, dream, dream. I said this one is a love song, so this is a dream. Okay, dreams. And it says here, dreams have always been ordained because what is a dream? A dream is a set of thoughts and impressions that can be caused by two types of dream. There is a dream that can be caused by activity, that is it's just your processing. And the thing about all, oh, you remember last week I talked about frequency? There's a frequency when you go REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. That is when you're actually dreaming. You're seeing images. The images can come in chapter 5 or 7 from a multitude of activity. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 or 7, for in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also uh, much activity. And then also, um, um, okay, this is dreams. Uh, also in Ecclesiastes, um, verse chapter 5, verse 3. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by its many words. In other words, it's the words are useless. So the dreams are more like, activities of your daily life. It creeps into your dream. 
and it's like a brain processing all the images that have been downloading into your life. I usually call these dreams soul dreams, and I usually say they're still important. If you remember a dream, even if they're from this factor, it's important. Because if you process a lot of soul dream in that area, it shows where your soul is. It shows that those images are seen from your soul side. So it's still important to analyze your soul, but not messages from God. But God said in the book of Job, chapter 33, verse 15, it says, In a dream, in a vision, in a night, when deep sleep falls upon men when slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men, seals their instruction. See, heaven still gives you daily instruction. Seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deep and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Now we check if this was true or not. Yes. Because uh, outside of the Bible, in the book of, um, I mean, not the book of Enoch, the other book, Jesha, and some of the other uh, books of uh, Adam and Eve in the early writings, it also covered the life of, of uh, Abraham. Abraham was a dreamer of dreams. A lot of his messages he got from God, uh, some, are, some are vision, he, he just see, he just hears a voice. Sometimes he see a light, but most of the time he had a dream. Before he entered Egypt, you know why he was frightened? Because he had a dream. He had a dream about some trees and how certain tree was chopped down, certain trees were spared. And in the dream interpretation, the, what the tree was chopped down was him, the other tree was his wife. That is why he became frightened of being killed. And, uh, so those are in the Apocrypha. Uh, but here, in the Bible, okay, let's look at the Bible. In, you don't have to turn to and read it all to you. Uh, Genesis 20 verse 3. Abimelech, God came to Abimelech in a dream to warn him and say, You are a dead man. <laughs> because the woman whom you are taken, she is a man's wife. Actually, that was Sarah and so God was protecting Abraham, uh, Abimelech, Abimelech, through a dream. Fair enough, God, God did. Because, and then Abimelech said, no, he didn't know. If he knew, he wouldn't have done it. God said, that's why I'm telling you now. <laughs> See, there's some goodness in him. So God spoke to him. And then, uh, uh, God says in verse 6, in the integrity of your heart, uh, and that is why I will hold you. Notice he did exactly what Job 30 says. I will hold you from sinning. Now the dream is telling him. And he remembered the dream. And uh, then you all remember um, Jacob. He had a dream. And uh, chapter 31 verse 10. It happened at a time when the flocks conceived. I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream the, the, the flocks which left upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and grey spotted. So he had a dream about his animals and what to do about that. And then in chapter 31 verse 11, the angel of the Lord spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And then, when Laban was going after um, Jacob, when he just took off and ran, uh, because Laban had bad intentions, he was going to be fierce and maybe violent, God in chapter 31 verse 24. Now Laban was not a good guy, but yet, Job 30, God will warn them. God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night. And say, be careful when you speak to Jacob. Neither good nor bad, just don't cross the line. And then you all know, chapter 37 was fine. Joseph had a dream. And then you all know, Pharaoh had a dream. Why did God give Pharaoh a dream? Because the lives of many are at stake. In fact, not just of Egypt. 
Because of Egypt, all the surrounding land was also safe from the famine. See, God is interested in lives and people. He made people. Don't you think that today, when people are in power or position, if there's some goodness in their heart, God will still try to tell them. Heaven will send messages to them. And try to direct them in the right path. How much more we who are believers. And uh, then, you have uh, the butler and the baker. They each had their dream. One dream is going to die, prepare to die. One dream was going to be released. And that miraculous interpretation is what sets Joseph up for the future. And so there are a lot of dreams all the time in the Bible that cover different Pharaoh's dreams. And uh, then uh, Gideon also had a dream. Besides the he testing God with all those, chapter 7, verse 13, Gideon had a dream. And uh, then God says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, uh, when he rebuked um, Miriam and Aaron, he says, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, I speak to him in a dream. Chapter 12, verse 6 of Numbers. And, uh, and then uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. After Solomon offered a thousand sacrifices, Solomon was not really that spiritual man. He was more like a man of the world kind of thing. But he had a heart for God when he was young. Uh, he became more and more worldly man. You see, Solomon is another typical example that we have about our message today. Don't have too much of the world. Solomon, he should have only one wife. Why are you going to add 999 <laughs> to make it a thousand? Right? He has 700 uh, wives and 300 concubines. 1,000 of them. I tell you, way noisy house. <laughs> uh, man, Solomon, why he must have so many horses? So much, so much worthy things. And these are the things that turned him away. He was not detached from the world. But when he was young, his heart was for God. And it says, uh, in chapter 3, verse 5, God appeared to him in a dream. In a dream by night. That was how he got his wisdom. In a dream. And now, uh, of course, um, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's time had a dream. And you know some of the visions that Daniel has? It was called visions of the night. And then he also said, in a dream. Joseph, uh, who was the adopted father of over Mary and Jesus, two dreams. In a dream, angel spoke to him. Pontius Pilate's wife. When Pontius Pilate was in a dangerous position, at that time, if he did the wrong thing, he would be condemned for the injustice. In eternity, imagine, imagine you were sitting in the judgment seat about Jesus. And it's because of his wife's dream. The wife says, I got a terrible dream. And he says, the man that you're about to judge is innocent. Why do you think Pontius Pilate suddenly says he wants to release Jesus? Why do you think he wants to release Jesus? You think he's a good man? You read the history of Pontius Pilate, he's not a good guy. His wife had a dream. The message of the dream was the man you're judging is innocent. And Pontius Pilate says he took water in front of them, which heaven's record at that time, eternity. Otherwise, Father and Father would have been God. And he washed his hands in public. And he says, the blood of this man, because he knows he's innocent, is on you, on the Jews. So the curse of sending in Jesus to death came upon the Jews. That's why they suffer so much. 
a dream that his wife had and warned him. Because Jesus, you know, the case of Jesus was all over. If there are papers, it will be all over the internet and papers. And also in Twitter. And Facebook. It was the big news of that time. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit came, comes in Acts chapter 2, old men shall dream a dream, young men shall see visions. That is why last week I talked about the frequency. Because I was trying to give you something tangible and practical that can help tune you to this simple level, elementary level I call it, of contact point with the spiritual world. How? When your conscious mind TKO, then you're dreaming. But now is to help you remember the dream, right? <laughs> Listen to this frequency or that level of music, it will produce certain dreams. And it will help you to remember. So, do you hear heaven? Yes, you do. Now, this is the elementary way he speaks to the whole planet now. Since we, you see, when humans lost open vision, God must replace something out. Dreams. Dreams. We have more than dreams. We have a lot of other things. Voice of Holy Spirit, all this thing. But let's not neglect this most elementary thing. Start a book and start a book to record your dream. All your, your in, impressions that God gave to you, the thoughts, the revelation. Sometimes you're not to see, sometimes you feel it. Like when you're praying, you felt that somebody was on your right and you felt some message come to you. Like that. As you begin to journal and write these things down, God knows you are receiving the message. And you know how like now this email, when they send email, uh, which, I, which I disable on my email anyway, so no point doing that online. Uh, when you send email, sometimes there is a way where your email can, can, re, can send itself back to know whether the email has been read or not. Return receipt. Return receipt kind of thing. So it's auto automatic. Uh, but normally I disable mine. So so you send, you wouldn't know. <laughs> but most people, one, it tells that it's been read. God knows that you are getting the message when you start writing. Writing them down. Then as you write them down, like I remember when we first started, uh, Alex used to do a lot of dreams. He still had dreams. And you always asking me, Pastor this dream, Pastor this dream, and wait, next time, one million members all coming in. Pastor this dream, Pastor this dream. So, I got a whole series called Interpretation of Dreams. Listen to that series. And then, I pray for you for the Interpretation of Dreams tonight, which is a gift that God gave to them. So, let's all rise together. Thank you, Father. Father, tonight we pray for these two things. That your people will be more heavenly, that you will detach their emotions, their mind, and their will from the things of this world. That these things of this world are to be handled by good Stephen, but nothing more. We shall not be attached to them. Just like we don't get attached to uh, a dirt of the earth, the shoe, or a shirt that will wear out in time. We like those things, Father, sometimes when they're nice and they're good. But we will not get emotionally involved. But set so too much of our thought energy to it. Or exercise so much will energy for it. So, Father, tonight operate in your people. Clean them up. Detach them from the uncleanness of these worlds. And as you said in your word, to the pure, all things are pure. So Father, put a purity in their heart so that they can go into the world and these things don't affect them. They can look at the things of the world that are sinful, that are this and that, but it won't affect them. 
because they are pure in their heart. And Satan has nothing in them. Secondly, Father, because I have awakened your people to your elementary message of the spiritual world, coming in dreams, I pray not only will your people dream dreams and see visions, but you give them the interpretation of dreams and visions. I pray for the spirit of wisdom that you give to Daniel. To come upon your people so that they will have a sense, not word for word, but they have a sense of the meaning of the dream. Just like Potiphar's wife had a sense of what her dream meant. And just like Jacob has a sense of what Joseph's dream meant when he dreamt about the sun and the moon. So Father, give this interpretation to your people and teach them to learn to interpret their dreams too. Then when there's special ones that need us to look into, especially to do it any times, then they can bring it to us, Father. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give you a good clap, Austin. And God bless you.